Nancy, you've been listening to the music of Nancy Jeffrey, and uh, my name is John Coloma. I'm one of the pastors here at EV Free. And on behalf of the family, the Salehammer family, I want to thank you for coming and helping us celebrate John's life. In fact, it might be good for us to, oh, before the most important thing you need to know, just functionally, is where the restrooms are. Uh, there's a number of them if you go left out here th through this door and another left, a whole bank of restrooms there. And there's a few here in this room. I was just looking around at the age of this group and <laughs> realized we should acknowledge that as a very important matter. We, uh, we won't be uh, announcing each person who will be participating in the service today. I uh, will just tell you that the family in bulk is participating in some of the eulogies and tributes. And then Pastor Todd Chapman from Richfield Community Church, one of the um, students of John, will be uh, bringing a message to us in a meditation. But otherwise, the names are listed in your program, the family members, and you'll be able to piece that together. But I think what we want to do right now is find out who you are. And in fact, the family wants to know who you are. First of all, um, Patty's uh, family, immediate family and extended, would you please stand, Patty? Okay, over here. Okay, and take a turn. And uh, Patty's father, where is Gordon? Right over here. It's great to have you here with us, Gordon. You may be seated. How about um, Claudette's family, John's sister? And immediate family, extended family, right over here. Okay. And then uh, Paul, your family, an extended family. Okay. And then there's a whole bunch of little ones in nurseries nearby here being taken care of by uh, folks who are worthy of the trust. Also, I want to uh, uh, find out who, who were some of John's neighbors. If you were a neighbor of the Selhammer clan here, just stand up right here. Great to have you here with us. Okay. Any from Fullerton Gardens, where John was for quite a few years. Great to have you here. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Good. Thank you. And um, how about uh, former students of Dr. Salehammer? Former students, stand. Oh, look at that. Okay. Very good. And let's, any of you who read Dr. Salehammer's books, would you please stand? Um, how about fellow colleagues and professors, theologians, would you stand and let us acknowledge you and thank you for your hearty work? Thank you. And. Um, EV Free friends and family, joint heirs, a variety of groups, would you please stand if you're here? Thank you. All right. Wonderful. You may be seated. And again, on behalf of the Salehammer family, we want to thank you for coming and sharing at this event. 
I'm going to read uh, Psalm 90, which to my understanding is the only psalm written by Moses. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man back to dust, and sayest, Turn back, O children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but a yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. Thou dost sweep men away. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. It is renew it, in the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are consumed by thy anger. By thy wrath we are overwhelmed. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days pass away under thy wrath. Our years come to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are three score and ten, or even by reason of strength, four score. Yet the span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of thy anger and thy wrath according to the fear of thee? So teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on thy servants. Satisfy us in the morning with thy steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. Make us glad as many days as thou hast afflicted us, and as many years as we have seen evil. Let thy work be manifest to thy servants and thy glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. I never get in a room like this where the child of, child, children of God are gathered that I don't think it's so appropriate, that chorus, we gather in this place to magnify your name. And here we're going to eulogize our beloved brother-in-law and your beloved friend. And the reason we can do that is because he magnified the Lord. And we pray, Father, we ask your blessing upon this service. We thank you so much for allowing us to know you, and for a lot of us, allowing us to know John in an intimate way. How we thank you for what you did with him and the way you used him, and we give you praise. And we give it in the special name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we say together, amen. Most of us know Patty, and we knew John, and uh, we enjoy that friendship but uh, many of you don't know Patty's family, her children and her grandchildren. We know David, of course, and he's a part of our fellowship here in Fullerton. And so we're going to ask Patty's family if they would all stand right across here in family groups. And Patty wanted you to see her family. She's proud of them, and you'll see why when they all come up here. And we'll introduce them uh, to you. Dave, why don't you come on over here just a little bit more and we can get everybody within sight there. Very good. So I will uh, do my best just to name the family units and I won't take a shot at all the little ones yet, but, <laughs> but uh, let's give it a try. Uh, most of us know David Salehammer, Patty's uh, oldest son, Patty and John's oldest child, oldest son. Right here, David, can you? Uh, yeah, very good. <laughs> And uh, standing next to Patty is uh, Patty and John's son, John Christian Salehammer, and his wife, Kelly. And they've come out from Boston to be with us uh, for this time. And next to John is their son, Peter, and his wife, Angela. And they've come from Wisconsin to be with us for this uh, memorial service today. And then down on the far end from 
New Hampshire, uh, John and Patty's daughter Betsy and uh, her husband Jason, Betsy and Jason, Jason Sukup, and we are thrilled to have all, the whole family here together today. So let's welcome them to California. Right. <clears throat> they're going to take the little ones. Uh, they're going to take the real little ones to a more interesting program. And, <laughs> but uh, we're going to. This is a servant's service of uh, remembrance and thankfulness for. John Salehammer's life and work. And so we're going to be sharing a lot of uh, memories today, and I hope it'll stimulate some with you. John? Good afternoon. On behalf of the entire Salehammer family, I want to say a heartfelt thank you for joining us today to celebrate the life of my father, Dr. John H. Salem. And to remember this man who had such a profound impact on our lives. We come together today from all over the map, from all walks of life, and for each person's own special reason. <laughs> There's Kleenex under here. We have here today a wife who has loved her husband through sickness, and health. Three sons and a daughter who are grieving the loss of the man we called dad. We have a brother and a sister who are enduring the loss of their little Johnny. And there are three ch of his children's spouses, eight young grandchildren, in-laws, cousins, nieces, nephews, each of which has their own individual memory of this man. We have with us pastors, preachers, scholars, and students whose lives have been indelibly influenced by this theological rock star. And there are others, others whose stories and contact with my father were not well known to each and everyone here for your own personal reasons. On behalf of my family, we welcome you here and appreciate your presence. Today is a bittersweet day the finality of death is more than our human minds can comprehend. And as humans, the contemplation of death leaves us with emotions that we have a hard time expressing. It leaves us with physical reactions we cannot control. And it leaves us with a void in our hearts that we cannot possibly understand how to fill. But there is a sweetness in my father's passing. It is comforting to know that the pain and suffering that he endured over the past decade has come to an end. There's sweetness in knowing that he no longer has to endure the nightmares and physical pains that have plagued his body and mind. And there's also great sweetness in knowing that he has stood at the foot of his heavenly father and received the grace of his savior, despite his, sorry, his own well understood earthly shortcomings. And it will come as no shock to anyone here when I state that my father was a very cerebral man. He spent most of his life contemplating concepts and ideas that most of us could never hope to wrap our minds around. One of my father's favorite concepts, thank you, to ponder was the concept of grace. In the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he wrote, it's by grace we are saved through faith, not by works, lest any man shall boast. And it is this grace that frees our spiritual bodies from the failures and shortcomings of our earthly bodies. At the same time, the concept of grace requires a level of humanity, whereby we must acknowledge the grace that is freely given and accept that forgiveness given to us through Jesus' death and resurrection. My father was not a humanist, but he was a man that was in touch with his own humanity. My father had high expectations for himself. He had high expectations for those around him, and especially his family and his children. He set the bar high in all things we did. His actions at times could be construed as strict, as harsh, and sometimes even cold. But through it all, no matter whether we met his expectations or failed miserably, my father loved his children. He understood and he forgave. In doing this, he gave a level of humanity to 
and demonstrated his understanding of this concept of grace. We rejoice in the knowledge that through grace, my father's human imperfections have been wiped clean, and he is enjoying his new and perfect embodiment in paradise. I welcome everyone here today to celebrate and remember my father in their own way. We encourage you all to freely express your emotions, as I have. <laughs> Cry openly, laugh loudly, hug freely. Find a quiet moment of solitude if you need it. Tell stories, raise your hands in worship and in celebration. Thank you. It happened to me already uh, this afternoon. I was asked the most common question that I am always asked when someone asks a question about my brother. And that question is this, which one of you is older, you or your brother? <laughs> People have always asked us that question. And so I developed a, uh, an answer. I, I would say, well, I used to be the older brother. But he was married first, had children first, and he has more children than we have and, and more grandchildren than we have. He certainly has more educational degrees and certainly more books published. But I could always say, but I've had more hair. <laughs> so I wouldn't let him forget that. But uh, I'm the oldest, John is my younger, brother. Actually, he was 20 months younger than myself and several years younger than our great sister Claudette. So what I'd like to do in the time that I have today, I'd like to look briefly at the big picture of John's life as it is captured in some detail on the back of your folder that you were handed when you came in. Then I'd like to share several generous tributes to John and to Patty from longtime colleagues and friends who couldn't join us here today. And then I'd like to end with a few personal reflections on my own little brother Johnny, as he was referred to. So if you take the back of your folder, I'm not going to read it all to you, but I am going to use some of it to see if we can cover the span of his 70 years. My brother, Dr. John Herbert Salehammer, a lion of the word and faithful follower of Jesus is safely home. He passed away January 9, 2017, after a long battle with Parkinson's and Lewy body's dementia. John was born in Moline, Illinois on October 17, 1946. That happens to be our mother's birthday, October 17. John graduated from Lakewood High School in Lakewood, California, and continued on in his education, eventually receiving a, a Bachelor of Arts degree from California State University in Long Beach, uh, a Master's of Theology from Dallas Theological Seminary, a Master's and a PhD from UCLA, and over his 36 year career in the classroom, John has taught at Biola University, Bethel Seminary, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, Western Seminary, Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, and Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary. He had a hard time holding a job. It was a <laughs> <laughs> But he always had opportunities to teach. His teaching was in great demand, and he was thrilled at the response of that. John served his country in the United States Army from 1968 to 1970. And I want to digress for just a moment here, digress if I might. Uh, John's first year of college was at Bethel College in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, and then he transferred to Wheaton College in uh, Wheaton, Illinois. But halfway through his uh, year at Wheaton, he withdrew from school so that he could volunteer for the draft. And uh, he wanted to serve. 1968, some of you will remember, was quite a big year. And there weren't a lot volunteering for the draft in those days. But uh, that was the decision John had made. Of course, um, my parents thought it was the end of the world. What a thing to do and what a time to do it. After uh, training uh, boot camp at Fort Ord, through a, several sort of interesting things that happened. Patty can tell you more of the details later. 
but John ended up being assigned to the Army Relocation Office in the Pentagon. Now, that, that doesn't sound, they don't make that sound too glorious. I was at his office one day. It was probably the tiniest room in the Pentagon, about the size of this platform up here. But that's where he spent his whole Army career in Fort Myers Army Headquarters, uh, just across the Potomac from Washington, D.C. While he was there, his roommates were solid Christian men. And they took him to the McLean Bible Church in Virginia. And uh, one got him really involved in Navigators. And he remains a friend to this day. And that was a turning point for John in his adult life as a Christian. And uh, he, he never looked back after that time. So the very thing that my parents thought would be the end turned out to be the beginning. And um, that's a part of John's, John's story. And, and then, of course, when he got out of the Army, he came to Cal State Long Beach. And he, <laughs> and he met a, uh, a cute little Campus Crusade worker who wasn't supposed to uh, date the uh, students. But somehow, she found a way to do that. <laughs> and uh, we'll pick up again here. John was married to Patty Engdahl on June 12, 1971, in St. Paul, Minnesota, where Patty was born and reared. Patty and John and their four children have lived in Minnesota, Texas, Illinois, North Carolina, and California, where John studied and taught. They would sometimes come home for Christmas or Thanksgiving. It was absolutely amazing. I never made one of the trips with them. The kids could tell us later what it's all like. But they would come straight, like from Chicago to Long Beach, and uh, with nary a stop except for, for fuel. And it was amazing, but they, uh, they were so good at that. And they, um, Patty and John, and, yeah, they, all these places where they lived, and then in California. And John was so thrilled to get back to to California, and uh, David was so thrilled to get back to California. John will be buried in Kingsbury Country Cemetery in rural Illinois. You'll see a picture of it later, near the farming village of Erie, where both of his parents, our parents, Claude and Belva Salehammer, were born, and near the city of Moline, where John was born. The quiet, small cemetery is the resting place of many Salehammers going back to John's great-grandfather, Joshua, who fought with his Illinois regiment in the Civil War. And you'll, you'll see a picture of that beautiful little quiet spot. So that's where John will be buried. His body will be buried. Tributes. We've received uh, some wonderful tributes from friends. And remember, friends can, uh, at a time like this, can wax eloquently, as, as John C. Salehammer said, uh, uh, John was not a perfect person. He and I had many battles. <laughs> I broke his arm wrestling when we were little kids. But John was a wonderful person, and you'll hear that in the words of these um, colleagues. First of all, I want to mention the uh, John Salehammer libra uh, library room that's being established at Southeastern Baptist Seminary in Wake Forest, uh, where John and Patty lived and where he taught. And John's whole library has stayed together. Patty was able to work out a great deal with them where they have his whole library and all of his study material. And you'll see a picture of it there on the screen. And uh, it's in their new library, and uh, it will be there for students to, uh, to use. The collection is comprised of language studies in Hebrew, Greek, Latin, German, French, the Old Testament studies as well. These works cover the gamut of fields such as theological studies, reference works, philosophical studies, cultural studies. Well, we could go on and on and on. But uh, how wonderful to have his whole library together. That's something he loved. He loved building that library. And so it is there now at Southeastern. Uh, in Wake Forest, North Carolina. A former student of John's by the name of Benjamin Quinn, who is now a seminary professor himself, pays this tribute to John. Dr. Salehammer was one of the best teachers I ever had, 
the privilege of sitting under. The truth is, however, he was light years ahead in his understanding of scripture and his insight into the original text. Dr. Salehammer was humble, gracious, and brilliant in the classroom. In 25 years of formal education, I cannot recall any other class where I learned so much. A tribute from a former, former student. Many of you know and appreciate Dr. Walt Kaiser, who was the dean of Trinity Seminary when John was a, a professor there and most recently with Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary in Massachusetts. And Walt is now the president emeritus of Gordon Conwell. He wrote this tribute to John. John Salehammer was always one of my closest friends and a real source of theological stimulation. His teaching at Trinity Seminary over the years was received by his students with great joy. They loved his classes. He was a master teacher if there ever was one. We, are, we all were enriched by his love for the gospel and his teaching and discipling of those who would teach the word of God. And then he says, Patty, you are my hero for the way you have shown compassion, not only to our family, but to so many others in Deerfield who needed special encouragement. May our Lord bless you and your love to him, to John, and to your family. May God bless all your children and those who will miss him along with us. The words John heard as he arrived in glory, no doubt were, well done, good and faithful servant. May God grant us his peace and grace to also finish well. Dr. Kaiser. One of John's colleagues was Dr. Wayne Grudem, who now uh, is research professor of theology and biblical studies at Phoenix Seminary in, uh, in Arizona. Wayne writes, I first met John Salehammer in 1978 or 79 when he came to teach Old Testament at Bethel College in St. Paul. We even shared an office for a year or two and enjoyed many thought-provoking conversations on every kind of topic in the Bible and theology. John was an amazingly brilliant Hebrew scholar, but also always relaxed and friendly and easy to talk to. When I left Bethel in 1981 for Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Deerfield, Illinois, and found that Trinity was also looking for an Old Testament scholar, I eagerly suggested John's name and was delighted when he and Patty decided to come to Trinity. His classes at Trinity were immensely popular, filled to the walls with enthusiastic students. He combined a love of God's word with a remarkably creative and thought-provoking approach to every text. I remember one day when he was about to get on his bike to ride home, and I asked him what he was listening to on his earphones that he was wearing. He smiled and said, the book of Isaiah in Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> he had a deep passion for understanding the Old Testament as a cohesive unity, truthful in every part because it was inspired by the God of the universe, the God whom John loved and trusted. His professional colleagues also recognized his contributions by electing him as president of the Evangelical Theological Society in the year 2000. The evangelical ac academic world will miss John Salehammer, and I am saddened by the loss of a friend who is perhaps now talking with Isaiah about that Hebrew text. <laughs> and Wayne concludes with Isaiah 40, 31. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Wayne Grudem. Another good friend and fellow student and professor with John is John Piper, Dr. John Piper. And John is a author and pastor and theologian and, and now a seminary chancellor himself back in St. Paul, Minnesota. And John starts off his tribute uh, citing Psalm 138, verse 2. O Lord, you have exalted above all things your name 
and your word. John Salehammer's life magnified the name and the word of God. It was therefore a great life. John Salehammer's unrelenting labors to lead others into the riches of the name and the word of God have been borne fruit for eternity. Our lives intersected briefly at Wheaton College, then for several years at Bethel College where we both taught, then at professional society meetings, and finally in correspondence. And of course, John was ever present by his books looking over my shoulder as I prepared sermons. At every step, his influence grew, and the effect was to steadily increase my confidence in Scripture as the Word of God and my love for the name of God as supreme above all names. John's way with the scriptures was at times for me frustratingly unemotional. If you know John Piper, he is frustratingly emotional. <laughs> <laughs> he was steady, not mercurial. He was patient with details, and what he saw through this steady, patient attention to the Hebrew and Greek scriptures was explosive. John's exegetical toil put fire in my soul for the gospel. How could it not when he showed me, like no one else, that the Pentateuch was thoroughly Pauline, that it preached the obedience of faith through grace? But perhaps even more pervasive was the impact of his method itself in the way he made most of us feel that we had scarcely begun to even read the Bible, that we were excited about finding a shard of copper when fathomless veins of gold ran beneath the surface of this book. But he was not unemotional. On the first day of opening our North Campus at Bethlehem Baptist Church in 2005, John was in the audience to honor the occasion and signify our love for the scriptures, I recited Psalm 118 from memory in my welcome. I saw tears in John's eyes. He approached me afterwards and thanked me for the psalm. This is what he lived for, for the name and the word of God, alive in the hearts of God's people. John's devotion to the name and the word of God knit our hearts together at a personal level of friendship. Even common dreaming, I wrote him personal letters asking for help in sermon preparation because of recalcitrant Hebrew and imperfect Jussives in the Psalms. And he generously answered and encouraged me. In 1998, after a particularly trying public debate I had with the spokesman for open theism, when I felt so embattled, John wrote me with words of strong encouragement. And perhaps most memorable of all, in 1996, I threw out the wild idea that maybe someday I would start a seminary. He responded with one of his longest emails to me ever, containing reason piled upon reason that why this should be done. And it proved to be prophetic. My admiration and affection for John Salehammer grew with the years. His love for the name and the word of God made him a stunningly faithful and devoted husband and father. His unpretentious plaid shirts. <laughs> we hadn't received this when the picture was chosen. Disarmed those who saw him repeatedly because disarmed those who saw him as a titan of Old Testament knowledge. And he endeared himself to me repeatedly because he escaped the academic trap of isolated atheological gamemanship. Instead, his heart was expansive. He loved all the scriptures, both testaments. He wrote a 600-page commentary on the whole Bible. Piper puts an exclamation point there. He did not despise systematic doctrine for the church. He wrote a book called Christian Theology. He was a large-hearted lover of the whole word of God, the whole counsel of God, and the whole people of God. I thank God that I came under his influence for almost 40 years. All praise to Jesus Christ, the name and the word of God. And there's only one left, so and you'll be relieved to know it's short and to the point. It's by Chuck Swindoll. 
Chuck wrote to Patty, Patty, my friend, Cynthia and I express our sympathy to you, your children, and all in your sweet family. While we knew this day would come, there was something within that kept hoping, that kept hoping otherwise. My admiration for your husband knew no bounds, not only because of those times I had the privilege of spending time and interacting with John, but also because of the numerous occasions I would come across his insightful writings in various books I would pull from the shelves of my library. Without exception, when that would happen, I would pause, look up, and call to mind the pleasure of his presence, his ability to address various subjects with keen precision, his ability to ask just the right question, and his choice sense of humor. Patty, it is also a special delight to interact occasionally with some of the faculty members on the Dallas Seminary campus who knew your husband, always referring to him with genuine respect. John may have left us, but his influence remains deeply embedded in our memory. I hardly need to tell you that his rewards will be many, and so will yours, Patty, for being such a loyal wife through the years, especially these latter ones, which have been so extremely difficult. Thank you for modeling the role of a faithful and loving wife all the way to the end. May our God of all grace comfort you as you release to him the one you and we loved so much. And he signs it softly and tenderly, Chuck. So tributes, and then if you'll allow me just a few personal reflections. No one would have predicted John's scholarly future from some of his youthful pursuits. <laughs> he ran away from home one time, and the reason for it was sort of theological. It was Halloween, and it was on a Wednesday night, and in my mother's house, we went to church on Wednesday night. So the compromise was, you can go out early and trick-or-treat before it gets dark. And John was so incensed at that, I think he was about 12 at the time, that he packed his things and he ran away. He came back in about an hour and a half. <laughs> John worked stage crew for the Beach Boys at their concert at his high school. John owned a Harley Davidson motorcycle for a while with monkey bar handlebars. And I was thinking about maybe it was the David's son part of it that attracted him early. Was that prophetic? <laughs> because he has spent so much in the prophecy of the son of David. John was a surfer at the Seal Beach Jetty in the early 1960s. He purchased an old beat-up 1934 Ford pickup to work on with our brother-in-law Bill, even before he had his driver's license. He loved horseback riding. Saturday mornings, we would go to Spiller's Stable uh, down at the uh, Flood Control and Carson Street on the east side of Long Beach and go riding at Spiller's. He liked it so much that he even went out and bought a set of leather reins. He couldn't have a horse, but he bought reins that he could use <laughs> when he got to the horse. In 1957, he was ejected from the city swimming pool in Moline, Illinois, because his hair was too long. <laughs> he wore a flat top and fenders. You'll see pictures over there. Uh, a la Ricky Nelson. And when he got wet, it hung all the way down to his shoulders. The Fenders did. He loved old cowboy movies. They were his favorites. Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, Hoot Gibson, Tom Mix, Gabby Hayes, Smiley Burnett. He loved them all. He even knew their horses' names. Trigger, Champ, Silver, Buttermilk. He loved those movies and continued even into his adult years. But the scholarly hints were there. In school, he loved math, and he did very well. He did well in German, and the hints of his ability to deal with languages began to show. And there were other things that showed that that gift would fully blossom as his life proceeded. In the last hard years, I would encourage John by saying to him, aren't you glad you didn't wait 
for retirement to write your books. And until just the end, he would smile when I would say that to him. Somewhere inside, he got the point. I would also tell him that even though his body was constrained to his wheelchair and bed, his students and books were at work around the world 24-7, ministering from, uh, from preparation they had received from John and others. People would always ask me, how's your brother? So I asked him one day, people always ask me, how, how are you? How are you? And he managed to say, I'm content. And about a year later, I said, you know, this has been my answer. Are you still content, I asked him. And he said, very. So what can we know other than just what we shared? But we know that the Lord knows, and now John knows. We thank so many of you who visited John and cared for Patty and her family and prayed for all of us. Thank you, thank you so much. I want to conclude my remarks, and I'm way over time, I'm sorry, <laughs> by reading, you gave me three assignments though, I had to do it. I want to conclude my remarks by reading John's last published words in the meaning of the Pentateuch, his last book, page 612. These could have been the last words that he wrote as a scholar. The compositional macrostructure of the Pentateuch, James, Genesis 1 through Exodus 15, is a witness to the centrality of creation in the biblical notion of salvation. But it is also left open to another theme that is also deeply embedded in the early narratives of Genesis. That is the blessing of eternal life. And this is the last sentence. It is thus not without purpose that the earliest biblical salvation history, he puts in quotes, Genesis 1 through Exodus 15, concludes by returning to the hope of eternal life that lies in the idea of God as our eternal king, Psalms 133, 3. So as John finished this book, his thoughts were focused on eternal life. Now he's experiencing that with the Savior.
And with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure and gives unto each day what he deems best, lovingly it's part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. In your bulletin you have the words to that hymn. Would you join me on the second verse of it? Every day the Lord himself is near me With a special mercy for each other All the cares he faced would never cheer me For whose name is Counselor protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he laid as thy days thy strength shall be in measure this the pledge to me he made help me then in tribulation so to trust thy promises O Lord that I lose consolation offer me within thy holy word help me Lord when toil and trouble meeting there to take us from a father's hand one by one the days and moments fleeting till with Christ the Lord I stand most people know my dad is a scholar professor and author and I wanted to provide a brief glimpse of life knowing John Salehammer as your dad. It was a wonderful childhood that he and my mom provided for us, both for me and my siblings. Uh, when I think of my dad, I think of a short conversation that I was able to have with him a few years back before his sickness was able to, or before his sickness took a more significant effect. I was able to tell him that I admired him and that I saw his life as a life well lived. We each have a certain number of days and how we use those days is our decision. And the way that he used the days that God gave him, what an example he set for us. My dad had a love for scripture and a love for learning. The image of my dad that stands out most is he's sitting on a fold out lawn chair at our baseball games. He and my dad came to all of our games. He and my mom came to all of our games, and my dad would sit there with his, with his fluorescent yellow Benita Bay head on, <clears throat> his glasses with his clip-on sunglass attachments that would flip down, <clears throat> and a deck of Hebrew and Greek flashcards. He always called them his. <clears throat> he always called them his vocab cards, <clears throat> and they went everywhere with him. So there he would sit, and he loved every moment of it, watching our baseball games and reviewing his vocab cards and learning. Our basement was, growing up, it was lined wall to wall, floor to ceiling with books. Lots of old books, and none of them were in English. <laughs> but as the son of a theologian, my interaction with those books was when our ping pong balls would get stuck behind them. <clears throat> so we'd stop the game and have to go fish behind them on the uh, bookshelves. 
And growing up, I remember thinking, I'm sure these are really good old books, but they sure do get in the way of our ping pong balls. <laughs> and my dad had a love for my mom and for marriage. It was a gift that we often took for granted to have two parents who loved each other, provided a strong, secure marriage and family. And in the moment, I didn't realize how lucky I was to have that in our family. And I loved watching my dad and my mom hugging in the kitchen and holding hands, going on walks. And what a testimony to the marriage to watch my mom selflessly care for my dad in his last years when he was unable to care for himself. Mom, we saw that and we really admire you. It was a difficult job, faithfully well done. And lastly, my dad had a love for us, his children. He played football with us out in the park and took us fishing up at the cabin. He swam with us in the pool, tried unsuccessfully to teach us Hebrew. <laughs> <clears throat> Wrestled with us in the living room and took us on road trips in the van. He read us Hardy Boys stories before bed. He won mercilessly at Bible trivia. <clears throat> And he was always so very proud of us and who we were and what we were doing in life. Thank you, Dad, for teaching us to love Jesus, to love scripture, to love our spouses, to love our children. You lived your life well. We love you and we will miss you. In Matthew 13, 47, and 48, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a fishing net. There's a swan into the water and gather the fish in every kind. When the net is full, it drag down, drag it up to the soul, and sit down in the soul to give fish in the crates and throw bad ones away. Jesus taught us how to fish for people. Whenever we go fishing with my dad, he always come with us. Whenever we go to the cabin for many years, there you have taught us everything from all the years, from now on. It was fun to be with your dad, but you will be fishing with Jesus. Matthews and the disciples, to my be your dad. Thank you for helping me to grow up in the Lord. Whenever I need help, you are there with me. When I go to Bible studies with your dad, I got interested into it. And also reading the Bible and learning from the scriptures. And I'm Betsy. So my father was an amazing man, and I am who I am in large part due to his influence. Throughout our childhood years, he held unique command and discipline, which at times were fearful, but which I am incredibly grateful for. He instilled work ethic, perseverance, and the ability and the joy of studying for endless hours. He was the one who encouraged me to apply to MIT and was my constant supporter in my academic pursuits, perhaps living a little vicariously through me as he always wished he could have been a doctor. Although he was Dr. Sailhammer, although we, his children, were always quick to point out that he was not a real doctor. <laughs> he was just a book doctor. <laughs> Um, as a new graduate from medical school, I loved sharing his name. This <laughs> I did love sharing his name. The same man, for all of his intensity, had such sweetness and a tenderness. 
that I... that I always cherished. As his only daughter, I alone experienced the father-daughter relationship. Precious memories of him combing my hair at night, talking about who I might marry one day, and that he was praying for him. He was my softball coach for years, although he knew very, knew very little about the game. <laughs> We read the Chronicles of Narnia together, side by side on the couch out loud when I was a first grader. I still have the vivid pictures in my mind that I imagined that even the modern movies now can't fade. In my 20s, we read Lord of the Rings trilogy out loud together, sweet bonding moments that I will never forget. It was not until my college years that I began a conversation with him about the Bible that continued over the years. As his daughter, I had the privilege of unique access to him and to his answers that maybe nobody else had. Frequent, long email correspondence about theology while I was away at school or training, reading his books, sitting in on seminary courses and Sunday school classes with the opportunity for follow-up questions on the drive home, asking questions about Bible, theology, and essentially receiving more than a seminary education over the years. I loved to watch him teach. Because of his love for the Lord and his written word, I developed my own appreciation for scriptures, which has transformed my life and my view of the world. He was a teacher, mentor, confidant, and friend, my constant supporter. I will miss him dearly. Well, I'm Todd, and I am a student of Dr. John Selhammer. The teaching now and for several years has uh, been relegated exclusively to what he's written. But um, I'm still learning from John. Uh, a privilege to share a little bit of what I learned I first met Dr. Salehammer in 1980, uh, seems impossible. I was 21 years old at the time, I'm 58 now. He was 33. Took every class I could from him at Bethel Seminary. He went to Trinity, I went to Trinity, and I took every class I could uh, from him uh, there. Next 20 years, followed his career, read everything he wrote, and I'd call him every once in a while when I was struggling with a text. Still remember a text in Romans 7 where I'm struggling and wrestling, and I didn't like to do it too often. I didn't want to bother him, but I called him and I go, Man, which way do you see this? And I still remember him asking, Well, which way do you see it? <laughs> and I told him, and he goes, He's so gentle always, right? You guys know, well, most of the time, uh, to me anyway, he was always, and he said, That's one way to look at it. <laughs> I really got to know him about 12 years ago. He was on a sabbatical and was out here, and somebody had put a debate together with he and some other professors at Talbot. I don't even remember how I found out about it. But it reminded me of the debates we used to put together at Bethel and Trinity with Dr. Salhammer and others. We got reconnected, and uh, they moved out here. And uh, one of the great privileges of my life, I got to hang with him a little bit. Several things I learned from Dr. Salehammer. The first is enjoying all of life is beautiful. I, I'm a pastor's kid, and through my dad, I had connections with pastors and academicians, theologians, and I, I'm just going to tell you, it didn't feel like to me most of them had a very exciting life. It felt like they sat in an office, and I don't know if they saw all the good stuff that was out there. My first real experience with Dr. Salhammer was in summer Greek in 1980. There were about 15 of us in the classroom. About the second day, we discovered through conversation we both loved the Rockford Files. I don't know if any of you remember the Rockford Files with James Garner. But he's a bumbling detective for whom almost nothing ever goes right, and he's got a pretty boring life, but he always solves it at the end. So about the third, fourth day, we started spending the first five, ten minutes of class every day talking about the rerun of the Rockford Files the other night. 
And I still remember there were a couple of guys in class. They were there to learn about God. <laughs> Let's get to the Greek. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Within a couple of weeks, everybody was watching the Rockford Files. <laughs> Here's a guy that loved the scriptures, a scholar with very few peers, and yet he had a love for so many things in life. Um, I have learned over the years that the sailhammer expression, though they feel things deeply, is pretty constrained. <laughs> but David, Betsy, John, Peter, your, your dad spoke with deep pride. You guys did it. Got it. And affection for you all. Patty, you, you were the light and the rock of his life. Reading the Bible canon should be fun. I'm a pastor's kid. I grew up going to church every time the doors were open. I can't tell you how many Bible studies I was in growing up, but I can tell you what I felt about them. They were dull. I just knew I was going to be bored. I just knew we were going to sit there and read this thing and pull it apart, but I knew this. I'd rather usually be doing something else. You went to Dr. Salehammer's class, and it was just fun. And the reason it was fun is he was having fun. You got the sense unmistakably every time you went to class that there's nothing that gave him more delight than hearing God's voice as he opened up the text. Changed my view of Scripture. Understanding who God is is the most important thing in life. John was devoted to the text because he was absolutely convinced God had written the sucker. And if you wanted to know who God was, why not hear from him as directly as you can? We were visiting, oh, it's got to be 10 years ago, going to lunch. I can still see him sitting next to me in the car. And he asked me if, he, if I thought he had the gifts to, to be a pastor. And I asked him, well, don't you feel called to be like a teacher? You're actually really, really good at that. <laughs> he said, I was called to read the word. That's what I was called to do. I was called to hear from God. Teaching is meeting others where they are. I've had the privilege over my life of being, I think, around some fairly smart people, a lot of them in seminary, and, and too often it's felt like they wanted me to understand how much they knew. Never had that feeling with John. In the classroom, in, Sunday, in adult Sunday school classes, in personal conversation, his objective was always just to meet us, whoever we were, where we were, and help us go forward. Knowing God produces humility. I don't know if I know anybody that had less of a desire to promote himself than Dr. Salhammer. There were times I used to think, man, if you just did a little bit of this, more people could get more good stuff. But he had this picture of God. It gave him this picture of himself. So years ago, I'd read a book called Blue Like Jazz by a guy named Donald Miller, and I really liked it, so I picked up his second book called Searching for God Knows What. Here's what he writes at the beginning, because I'm reading along in his book, and all of a sudden he mentions Dr. John Salhammer. I, I'm a little more expressive than the Salhammers. And here's what I read in about page 52. I'm just reading through this. You don't have to read the Bible for long before you realize the folks who wrote this book were quite special. With enormous capacities for feeling and understanding truth, Paul and John are definitely my favorites, but after those two, my favorite writer in the Bible is Moses. Moses most likely wrote the book of Job, and when he was finished, he wrote Genesis through Deuteronomy. I took a class on Moses from a man named John Salheimer. It was the best class I've ever taken. I didn't normally take Bible classes back then, but my friend John McMurray told me John Salheimer is one of the smartest guys in the world when it comes to talking about Moses. 
I told him I still didn't want to go to class, that I wanted to watch television, but at the time I was living with John McMurray and his family, and he told me that I had to go if I wanted to continue living in his home. <laughs> so I went to his class. And about five minutes into it, I knew I was taking the best class I would ever take. If you ever have the opportunity to take a class from John Salehammer, you should. His knowledge concerning the Old Testament, actually the entire Bible, is quite ferocious. Well, I read this. John and I get together for lunch, and we're driving to the restaurant, and they go, hey, I was reading about you and searching for God knows what, Donald Miller. Did you know he wrote about you in there? And John just said, yeah. I go, what did you think about what he said? Well, I didn't read it. Don't you want to know what he said about you? I think it's still some memories. He's in the passenger seat over here. He looks at me and kind of goes. <laughs> My guess is most of us would have been at the bookstore. <laughs> Buying one copy, and then if it looked good, before we left the store, we'd have probably bought several for families and friends. Seeing God's grace from the beginning to the end of the Bible builds an unshakable confidence. I grew up thinking, mistakenly, that the Bible was kind of this encyclopedia of historical events combined with a manual for behavior. I grew up thinking and believing that the Old Testament people were saved by keeping the law. And the New Testament people, we were saved by grace. John unpacked the Bible in the way with which I was unfamiliar to help me see that the Bible is essentially a love letter from God. The primary theme of which is grace from beginning to end, from Genesis 1 to Revelation. God loves us, God loves us, God loves us. Now, there's other stuff in there, like we messed up and we're in big trouble, but he loves us. So he's provided a solution for us. He saw me how there was an organization not only within books, but between the books, how the Old Testament had been put together. And there's this thread of God's grace from the beginning to the end of this thing. He taught me that reading, truly reading the Bible will change your life forever. I had a BA degree from a decent undergraduate institution, but before I had Dr. John Selhammer, I'm gonna tell you, I really didn't understand how to read. Don't misunderstand me, I could decode words, but I didn't really understand how language worked. Remember in my first Old Testament class in the fall of, of 1980, where he, he threw out this idea, words have no meaning in and of themselves. Now, you want to see some young seminary students get excited, say something like that in the classroom. Words are just symbols of ideas. Well, I'm a college student. I never heard this stuff. And the content and the meaning of the, uh, of the idea is rooted in the guy who writes or says it. It's in his intent. And so we got to figure out what the symbols are actually trying to convey. It turned my world upside down. I got this concept that we all bring to the interpretation of Scripture, the filter of our experience and our background. Raised in the church, not raised in the church, but we have a view of God. Got it from our parents, got it from our third grade Sunday school teacher. And we have this filter, and when we look at the Scripture, we inevitably look through the filter of our experience. We cannot help but do that. but sometimes it ends up determining what our interpretation of the text is. Really, the idea is that we interpret the text and allow that to build our theology of, God, this was mind-boggling, life-changing stuff. Then he gave a comment I'll never forget. I could tell you which row I was sitting in, which seat in the classroom at Trinity when he gave this profound statement. You may want to write this down. Big ideas are more important than little ideas. 
And he helped me understand how too often we get stuck in these little ideas and we make them big ideas when they're really not. But the little ideas add up to a little bigger ideas that add up to bigger ideas that add up to the big idea. So the question always is, what's the big idea? Well, she teaches me, this is in my first two years at seminary. I'm learning to love reading the Bible, looking for big ideas. And there's a big idea that's revealed while I'm there. Saved by faith, very familiar with that. I'm a pastor's kid. But a big idea of scripture that I had missed was that justifying faith leads to changed life. Now I had kind of the cultural fruit of Christianity, right? Don't smoke, drink, or chew, or run around with women who do. And I didn't live that perfectly, but kinda. But this idea that you would treasure Christ and you'd want to pray, you'd want to read the Bible, you'd want to share the gospel with somebody else. I'm a seminary student preparing to be a pastor because John Salhammer taught me how to read. And I looked at the word and saw what God says about what genuine faith looks like came to realize I really didn't have it. There were other influences in my life. But John Salhammer, just teaching me to read, helped me see the glory of Jesus. And I came to treasure Christ. And there is no turning so the great passion of my life is to help people see Jesus, to see God. You know the best thing I think I can help, I can do to help people see that? Do what John did for me. Help them learn how to read the Bible a little better for themselves so they can hear this directly from God. I love you. Because hearing it directly. All right. Believe it or not, I threw out a bunch of stuff that I had learned from John. We already read Psalm 90, so we're going to go here. Perfect choice. Perfect choice. It's a psalm of Moses, it's a song, it's poetry. I remember John saying in an uh, in Old Testament class on the Pentateuch, you know, Moses has given us this historical narrative to reveal who God is, but there's sometimes when the facts and just the historical narrative, because it's not just about the head, it's about the head and the heart. So what Moses does is he breaks into these poems intermittently because he wants us to feel what he wants us to understand. That's what Psalm 90 is now. We're going to go fast through this, and we're going to take an overview. I was talking to a pastoral buddy this last Wednesday, and talking about, hey, you know, Patty asked for Psalm 90, and he goes, oh, that is perfect for John. And he goes, man, there's a lot in there. Are you just going to take a piece of it? Can't take a piece of it. I mean, John's the guy that helped me understand, you got to see the big picture. You gotta see the whole. So there's a lot in this. But we're gonna take a quick walk through the overview, and Steve already read it, but here's where it begins. Here's the big idea God loves us, He's our refuge, He's our strength, He's our hope. Not primarily what He does for us, but us having relationship with Him. In many ways, it's Moses. He's going to throw the ideas he throws in the Pentateuch in the same book. But here's where he starts. Lord, you have been our dwelling pace in all generations. And there's the big idea. Here's where we find our joy. Here's where we find our significance. Here's where we find our meaning. Here's where we find our purpose. It's in relationship with God. Why? Reference to creation. Because before the mountains were brought forth, or ever uh, you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So here's the big idea. God is different than everybody else. How do we know that? 
He was actually here before anything or anyone else was here. Remember John in class, talking through Genesis. We like to go to, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He said, we go too far. In the beginning, God. That's the foundation and the premise upon which everything else is built. And John's got the compact commentary. Fortunately, he wrote something on Psalm 90, so I'm not too far askew today. My only criticism always of the compact commentary is that it's way too compact. But why can we go to God as our refuge and strength? Because he's God. And there's nobody else like him. We goes in then to our problem. Genesis 1 in the first couple of verses, Genesis 3 here in verse 3. You return man to the dust and say, return, O children of man, for a thousand years is yours in your sight are but as yesterday, when it is past or as a watch in the night, you sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and it is renewed. In the evening it fades and it withers. And we have this contrast between the eternity of God. He was here. He made it all. In our lives, like a piece of grass grows up fast, and then it disappears. There's a contrast here, but it's more than just a contrast. It's let's find our hope in the eternal God, but recognize who we are. A thousand years to God? Nothing. We messed up, so we're going to live short lives. He loves us, he loves us, he loves us. He created us to find our joy in relationship with him. He's our dwelling place, but we messed up. And that's not okay. Verse seven. For we are brought to an end by your anger, by your wrath, we are dismayed. You've set our iniquities before you, our secret sin in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. 70 years for John Salhammer. If I'm God, this is not the way I design it. Life is short, toil and trouble. I got reconnected with John and got to hang with him about the time that his health I don't know how you ever measure this thing, but this is probably the smartest guy I've ever had the opportunity to know. Started losing his balance. Had to quit riding his bike. We'd go to lunch. I did a lot of assistance in getting him in. He'd order, but couldn't always eat that much. Nothing like what you guys have been through. Nothing. But harder than watching the deterioration physically. It was this brilliant guy who's a master teacher who helped me see Jesus. Lose the ability to communicate the magnitude and depth of understanding about God that was in him. This life is short. God's eternal. <laughs> short, but we don't get it. A rhetorical question, so who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? Who really gets it? And well, we got so many problems dealing with today. We got the mortgage, we want to get a promotion at work, and we're thinking about the vacation. You know, it seems absurd to me, and I'm not going to suggest it's bad to retire, but... We go to school and then we work like crazy for 40, 50 years so that feels like to me the mentality of Americans so we can enjoy like 5, 10, 15 years of retirement and we don't really think beyond that. That's what Moses is trying to tell us. God is eternal. 
We made some bad choices. This life is going to be short. Pay attention to what's going on. If you're here today, 70 years used to feel like to me a long time. I'm 58 now. 70, 70 doesn't seem that far away. Seems like yesterday that John and I were talking about Rockford Files. So Lord, given our propensity to focus on the immediate and focus on ourselves, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Oh, Lord, you get how weak we are. We get so caught up in the moment, we lose perspective. Lord, give us perspective. John Salhammer numbered his days. Because of that, there's a bunch of us out there and a bunch of us trying to help others do a better job of numbering their days. Then he gets to the end. This request for deliverance for a deliverer. You're eternal, we're in trouble. But we know you love us. Help us to number our days. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Those of you who know John and his teaching of the Psalms, he saw Jesus all through the Psalms. Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. Here's the core of it. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Father, help us to number our days and make more clear to us your mercy, your grace, your love, your plan, your work. Now, I'm going to tell you, we got a huge advantage over Moses. Now, he was inspired by God and he had all those special experiences, so I don't want to diminish that, right? But he's looking forward to the great deliverer. We get to look back. John helped me more than anyone else see the plan of God, see the beauty of Christ. Here's the key to see God's work. Now, here's my deep conviction. It comes from my personal experience as I was taught by a guy by the name of John Selhammer. There's no clearer way to see the work of God than to read the Bible for yourself. You think it's dull, you think it's hard, you think it's boring. On behalf of John Selhammer, don't give up. God's work is glorious. It is awe-inspiring. It is life-transforming, no matter what age we are. Help us to number our day, Lord. Give us perspective. And show us your work. And then Moses, most appropriately, ends it here. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us. You've delivered us. You're revealing to us your work. We see your glory. And then he ends it this way. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Here's how it ends. Lord, as we see your work, May our work be established. Now here's our work to point to his work. No one I've known has done that more for me than Dr. John Salhammer. His life was devoted 
to these two things. Seeing the work of God and then helping others see the work of God. That's what he lived for. Here's the best way I think we can celebrate John's life. Lord, help us to number our days. Give us an eternal perspective. Help us continue to see your work. Keep reading the Bible. If you're struggling, find somebody who can help you. Read the word. Here's my second suggestion. Read John's books. Last thing I learned from John. We trust God in all circumstances. He's smarter than we are. He's got plans for us that we may not like. But we trust. I got to hang with him through this deterioration. Never once a sense, why me? This is unfair. But I always treasuring God. These last several years, Patty, you have been a clear illustration of trusting God, of dwelling in him, because there isn't anything better than dwelling in him. John now resides in heaven. Am I convinced he's found Isaiah? Somebody's going, so 43 verse 7 here, why did you say it that way? And Isaiah's going, well, here's what I thought. And John's going, well, you know, I think you could have said this way. It would have been a little more clear. And then Isaiah goes, well, you know, I was inspired, right? And John goes, oh, yeah, 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 I got it all. (laughs) Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for giving us John. His husband, father, father father-in-law, uncle, friend, teacher. Our prayer is that we would continue to see your glory revealed that we would find more of our encouragement and hope in dwelling with you. Thank you for welcoming him home. Thank you for giving him all that you accomplished in Christ. The inheritance is his through faith in Christ. Father, continue to draw each of us closer to you and particularly put your loving arms around Patty, the kids, this family. May they know that peace, the comfort, and the joy that comes from dwelling with you. Thank you, Todd. I think we're all better people having spent some time together here together with the family. This is my third memorial service in the last 24 hours. And I was thinking about what Solomon wrote, Ecclesiastes 7. Would, would, would John say that Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes? Okay. He says this, it's better to go to funerals than festivals. For you, there's a better return on it. He says, sorrow is better than laughter. It may blotch the face, but it scours the heart. Eugene Peterson. And I think family, as you've shared your dad with us and his impact on your life, as we've heard story after story of this humble man of God, we realize that uh, he didn't just write books. He, he was quietly writing on our hearts, maybe for this moment. and. Uh, So it's good that we have been here. I would encourage you not to go back home and watch the Rockford Files yet and just let some of this sink in of what we've heard and look at our own lives so that we can confirm the work of God's hand in our lives and affirm what he's doing in and through us. A couple of things before we wrap up here. One, uh, we've mentioned the new NIV uh, Bible commentary. There's 100 copies of that over there. 
And if you have not had a copy before in your life, uh, we want to invite you as long as they last to take one per family. That's Patty's gift to us. If you'd like to give a gift in uh, John's name, there were two things that the family chose as uh, possible things to give your, your money to. One would be the Compassion Fund here at the church. And the other would be the Disability Family Fund. Um, both of those, John and Patty, have been very involved in. Uh, it's a good Samaritan Center and other things. And if you'd like to do that, we encourage you to be generous. Make the check out to one of those things, and um, it's listed in your program if you need that information. Make the check out to EB Free and write in the corner which fund you'd like it to go to. Also, you were given in your program a, a memory sh sheet. Uh, we didn't have open sharing, you know why, because <laughs> we didn't have time to eat breakfast together here, and uh, you need to get home. But I would encourage you, I would ask you to take that sheet, and before you go to bed tonight, maybe jot a memory that you've had with, with John over the years or a way in which he influenced and impacted your life. And you could give that through the mail to Patty or to Paul or one of the family members. Because in the days to come, when you go home and these flowers uh, start to fade, uh, during the sleepless nights, Patty and the family will be able to read these and find great comfort. So I encourage you to do that. Um, there'll be no reception line, per se, this large crowd in this room, but the family will hang out. We encourage you to greet them. The food is behind the wall there. There's a light reception that we would like to have you join us in and also greet one another. And uh, I want to just thank you again for coming. Uh, some of uh, the folks have visited uh, on the internet. This has been out there to a lot of the students who wanted to come and could not make it across the country. And for you who have come. And we want to end tonight with um, the doxology. And I thought we would do it a cappella. In uh, just that means, I mean, in the Tanakh or the Septuagint and Latin Bible, I'm not sure which it was. It means just voices. And we'll lift our voices together. I want you to stand as we sing one verse of the doxology, and then we will bless you as you go your way. Let's sing it together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. If you were at one of the previous services, and this will consider this your second blessing <laughs> from God's word, may the Lord continually bless you with heaven's blessings as well as human joys. May you live to enjoy your children and grandchildren. And may God bless you, Israel, and the cities and the communities in which you come. Psalm 128. And then number six. The Lord bless you, both now and into the future. May the Lord keep you and protect you wherever you go, not just with your body, but your heart and mind. May he make his face shine on you. May you sense him smiling at you with pleasure. May he be gracious to you, and may you be gracious to others in return. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and show you his glory and shine his glory on you and shine his glory through you so that when people run into you, they'll see his glory. And may he give you peace. May we rest in peace as we go. God bless you. Enjoy the family. Enjoy each other. Thank you again for coming. Enjoy some food in the back. Amen.